Hello everybody, uh, it's a great pleasure for us today to have Gabby and Dos Reis as our first keynote speaker. Uh, I assume maybe some of you know Gabriel, uh, either because of his involvement into the GCC project for so many years, uh, as contributors, as well, you release manager at some point too, yeah. yes, and uh, maybe for his continuous work on improving the languages, uh, I think like a lot of very interesting new features from C++11 and C++14, uh, so there's too much to actually quote, are coming from Gabriel's work uh, with a lot of other people. Uh, so it's very great to have you there because you, you made a lot of, um, of things possible in the language we are all using there. So Gabriel was or still is an assistant professor in Texas A&M, and you recently moved to uh, Microsoft, That's right? right. Um, so I hope this presentation will actually help us go into um, the new state of what you are going to do for C++, and I hope we will enjoy uh, this talk as much as we do. Mm. Thank you, Gabriel, for being here. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'm very pleased to be here. Yes, I joined Microsoft um, recently, and I used to be release manager and contributor to GCC, and, and then I moved to the other side. Um, has been great so far. Um, what I'm going to talk about is mostly forward-looking, uh, supposed to you know up running already in the standard. And I thought that this audience, who is very template generated programming, uh, might be interested in what we might want to add to C++. Right. So, um, my main focus when I moved from when I was in France, I was still working on uh, on programming tools. But when I moved to to A and M, working with Biani, it was really. Um, trying to improve development tools, not giving developers uh, better tools. And one of the tools that we really, really like is, is the language. We have the compilers, the linkers, or the editors, but language is what allows us to express our ideas. Sometimes it gets in the way. And one of the things I've been trying to do is to remove those obstacles. Uh, the tools we use shape the way we think, right? Um, if you only program in C with macros, you believe macros are the best thing ever invented after uh, Brecht, right? I don't believe that. Um, so the, the, the work that I'm going to talk about is not something that started when I went to macros. It's something I've been working on before uh, joining Microsoft. I still, I'm still working on it on my free time and with uh, some of my students. So essentially, you know about it, it's all about trying to uh, make templates less scary, right? Um, there are corners in the programming industry when you say template, they go like this. And then you spend days explaining it all. It's really simple. It's much better than uh, macros, voice star, and all those kind of stuff. So the work has been um, supported by the National Science Foundation, usually support uh, basic research. And interestingly, in the last five years, they have been trying to, uh, to support things that work in the real world, right? You still have to justify the research part. So this is more R&D than pure R. And definitely at Microsoft, uh, we, we pay a lot of attention to the combination of both R and Z. Okay. So, um, the, the premise of my, no, this personal uh, view of programming, right? And I think it is shared by many people I've worked with, Biani, uh, collaborate with uh, uh, Stepanov and a bunch of other people, is that Good programming is mathematics. So when I say mathematics, I'm not talking about some fairly abstract category theory. I'm talking about very simple, basic things that we learn in high school, right? Uh, basic arithmetic, basic linear algebra, and basic logic. That's all that we need uh, to get most of this stuff done. Okay, 
So, uh, my, the most fun I do is, um, is colored by my background. I started doing uh, symbolic completion. You can think of complete algebra, uh, Maple, uh, Mathematica. Compiler construction is symbolic computation, right? Your, your compiler is symbolically executing your program and then outputting something else, right? So all of that is symbolic computation. Uh, of course, that naturally got me to generic programming, C++, and uh, in the last 10 years, I've been paying attention and trying to invest a lot of time into trustworthy computing. Uh, can you trust your compiler? So usually, when you, when you write programs, you compile and you run, it doesn't do what you do. You think, you know, you expect, and it's a bug, and usually you blame your own program until you spend, let's say, a week and realize, no, it's not you. Your program's just fine. It's a bloody compiler doing stupid things uh, behind your back. Uh, but usually we don't blame the compiler. And you'll be surprised to see how many bugs you actually stupid bugs you can find in compiler. So question to you, can you trust your compiler? Uh, go to GCC uh, website, you know, bug database, and look at the bug number. I think it's, it's near 60,000, something like that. Um, some of them are not just bugs. Some of them just requests for you know, extensions or documentation. But most of them are real, real bugs. Some of them obscure. Some of them just like, how can that possibly happen? Right. And yes, question? No. Uh, so uh, in my kind of R&D effort, I decided to, uh, to look at the things that I really care about, which is templates. Um, and in, in less crowded environment. So we all know that you know, C++ syntax is all it is, and um, we can do better. Uh, and there are other things like anarchic conversions between int double in, in both you know, ways, just crazy. Uh, so I decided to, to work on something called Liz. It's just a research uh, programming language uh, where a lot of things have been abstracted. If you, uh, if you look at some other uh, efforts like uh, Stepanov's book, uh, Elements of Programming, you'll see that you know, he really doesn't believe in implicit conversions, especially when it goes in in you know, all directions. So before going on, and because you'll see some Greek letters, and please don't get offended, uh, and some Haskells, I first want to, to make a confession in case there is some kind of, um, uh, you know, doubt, especially given my current affiliation, C++ really, really rocks. It is. Uh, uh, okay, this might be preaching to the choir, but it really rocks compared to the alternatives. Okay. Um, and usually you, you get this uh, feedback. Oh, yeah, but it is an unsafe language and you, know, you can't trust it. Uh, I'd like to call that uh, no, probably not bullshit because it's a family program, but uh, basically that. Uh, <laughs> You, you can write dependable systems in C++. This is not just a possibility. It is done every day. Okay? And it's even better now that we have almost C++ 14 uh, with all the improvement we got in the language and the sonar library. You really need to say new or delete directly, right? So you get all your resources managed directly and you can trust the, the type system, you know, the core of C++ is actually type safe, right? You know, I'm, I'm pretty sure people watching outside or here will challenge me to prove that. Okay, I don't have proof now, and I probably won't have in 10 years, but it is a firm belief that the core of C++ is type safe. And uh, we should try to evangelize that and, and bring that to the you know, greater world. We shouldn't uh, be shy of you know, making that point. So, I uh, just want to make a you know, quick point on, you know, trustworthy system, just make a bold claim. The core of C++ is type safe. I just want to, you uh, know, give you some pointers because um, I've been able to substantiate part of this claim in the more academic world. 
So um, the first thing is that generic programming actually is where you want to go uh, if you want that you know, a safe system, dependable systems, because that forces you to uh, write your code in, a, in such a way that you don't make implicit assumptions, right? If you, if you only work in terms of int, well, int's a part of operations. Is it age, length, and sometimes you multiply length that gets to your surface, is that what you want? You know, whereas when you express your ideas in the more abstract, you know, sense, uh, using only the minimum requirement that you need, then you're forced to be honest with yourself. Of course, you like uh, something to, you know, to keep you in check. We don't have that completely yet, right? Uh, we're working on that. It's called concept and all of that. But for the most part, when you instantiate and you do something fishy, you you get called on, right? You might not get the most friendliest. Uh, 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 error message, but you'll be told something. Uh, so, the thing that actually puzzles me is that, so C++ has been around for more than 30 years, right? And a lot of languages come uh, later and they all, you know, claim to be safer than C++. And very few, if any, have actually taken the real lessons from, from C++. You have the core semantics, constructors and destructors. Yes. <laughs> um, they will go so far as to invent uh, finalizers and try finally, but they won't have destructors, deterministic destructors. I, I just don't understand why, and it puzzles me. And if we have to take anything out of C++, it is that. Constructing destructor, that is the foundation of anything safety dependable you want to have for C. Okay? Of course, you have the direct mapping to hardware. That allows you not to have leave room to some kind of, um, you know, or the runtime in between you and the hardware. And by the way, that runtime, you need to write it in some <laughs> language, right? Uh, you really don't want to use anything other than C. Because you have to trust that other language. So uh, this is a point actually that uh, we made at Popol uh, two years ago. That if you look at constructor destructors and you pair them properly, the, the so constructor destructors they, they, they provide a meta protocol, right? In constructor you can put some arbitrary computation, in destructor you put some arbitrary computation. But the genius of of Biare was that if you look at the meta protocol, it's actually safe, and that's all you need. And that is why all our smart pointers rock, right? It, it, that part is safe, okay? And, and before our work, you know, people actually proved that uh, virtual function call, even during construction destruction, is type safe. Okay, and that work was done by some other giants in, in computational uh, logic and, and program verification. Okay, and, and before that, we also proved that you know, the, when, when you write your, your classes, create object, the, the compiler try to lay out object, the memory to, you know, most of them will try to use efficiently you know, the storage and use very complicated algorithms, whether it's GCC, Clang, VC++, they all do very clever stuff, okay? Uh, so we were actually able to prove that for real world algorithm in a large class of them, they're not just sound, but also safe with respect to construction destruction and virtual function dispatch, okay? Uh, so the claim I made earlier that the core semantics of C++ is type safe can be substantiated, okay? This has been checked by the experts, uh, you know, in the field until they call me tomorrow and say, oh, you know what, the, your paper is no longer valid, but I don't believe that. And before I, left academia, one of the goals I had was to um, build a verified C++ compiler. That's, you know, kind of bold project. But the point is that if you want to have people believe you that they can write dependable software, say, you know, air vehicle, those very expensive one-seat vehicles that, you know, when they crash, 
people die. So if you want people to write software that control them in C++, you really, really want to give them confidence that it is possible. You can't just say, you have to test, but you can't just say test, right? Because the compiler is doing a lot of stuff, you know. Uh, uh, you have to give them some assurance, some, you know, formal assurance. And you wanted to, to build this formally verified uh, C++ compiler. And so the part I was able to do with uh, uh, some of my uh, collaborators, Xavier Leroy, who actually built the uh, similar thing for C, right? It is used by, his compiler is used by uh, Airbus in, in Europe for many parts. Um, and the next step was actually exception handling. That one looks quite funny. Uh, and I'll have a lot to, to say probably next year for some talk uh, about exception handling and how to express that and what kind of guarantees we can expect. Um, if you have construct destructors, you pair that with exception handling, then you have really, really solid foundation for writing dependable systems. Today, people can't use exceptions in um, some dependable systems like, you know, avionics, uh, because we do not know how to bound the time it takes to catch an exception. When you turn an exception, we don't have guarantee of when it will be caught, if it is even caught. Right. Uh, when you're doing hard real time, you have deadline, you really want to meet that. And we don't know yet how to do that. But it is possible to make you know, uh, improvements in that field. Now, back to the subject of uh, axiomatic programming. So I designed this you know, language mostly for research, We're trying to understand templates and what kind of type system we can have for template. You know, the idea is to have concepts in a way that will be uh, usable by ordinary programmers. When I say ordinary programmers, I mean you shouldn't need to uh, obtain a degree and a master's or a PhD in, in template before you can write modern C++. You, should, you know, your first class of C++, you should be able to use templates and not even, even need to understand all the rules. When we were at the NM, Bianne had this uh, course you know, for freshmen on, on C++. You know what? The very first class, they will use vector of int. Way before they, they even hear about malloc or new or any of those things, right? The first container they will use is vector. And they use templates, solve those things before you understand what a template is, how you can define it. Okay, so, um, we really, really wanted to, to improve templates. And I suppose today there's a lot of w talks on, uh, on templates. And last year, probably had uh, Andrew Sutton talk about concept light. So what I'm going to say today hopefully doesn't overlap uh, with any of the talks today, neither the talk of uh, um, uh, Andrew. So the the thing that I really, really wanted to do is to integrate automated deduction. Why? Um, the reason is that when I look at a lot of template code, it looks to me as people spend a lot of time trying to tell the compiler what it already knows. Right? <laughs> and, and sometimes they get it wrong. But because we have so many rules and conversions, sometimes compilers say, oh, no, wait. Sometimes like, OK, I can make it work, but not doing what you really want. So uh, a good way to take that complexity out of the picture is to make the compiler smarter, deduce things it already knows. Right? We, we have template argument deduction. But the way we program with template is that we have this database you know, of template serializations, and there is only one level of things. You know, you can query template, how you associate template arguments. But we don't, the compiler is not smart enough. Or, or, right, I should say the language rules currently are not designed to allow the compiler to make chains of deduction from uh, you know, a set of knowledge it already has. And for that to, to happen, I really wanted to have I know, uh, a form of uh, automated deduction. Um, 
I've heard people say that, oh, if it is happening implicitly, then the compiler will do something in my back that I didn't intend. Uh, I don't know exactly how to interpret that. Because sometimes, not just because you write it explicitly, it means that it is correct. I don't trust any reinterpret cast. Okay? And that you have to write it explicitly. And I don't trust any of them. Even when I'm given the code and justification, I'm always suspicious but that it won't do what I want. I tend to trust more template argument deductions. But I, uh, is that me? Uh, when, when I call, uh, you know, find on two iterators from segment container and, and output and deduce correctly that, well, I have output and input, I don't really need to tell, again, combine some other forms so I can have a check. That's just fine, okay? But when I have to supply explicit template arguments, I'm, I'm crazy. Maybe I'm not smart enough, you know, at probably eight. But saying something very explicitly, when a compiler already knows it, is a good way to get yourself caught into, uh, you know, some hard to debug situations. And the other thing is that I really want to break with conventional type checking. Uh, what do I mean by that? I will give you two examples of what I call conventional type checking and hopefully you get a sense. We do a lot of those in C++ and to move forward, we really need to add something new to the picture. So briefly, I'll just tell you, so these are you know, students who have been working with me since I started. So Carla was the, the first student on the project. She wrote the parser and started the elaborator. And then uh, Eric came in and, and write, wrote some libraries and also worked on the, on the uh, compiler. Jason uh, started about two years ago uh, with his PhD. So he, he has network background. He's an uh, electrical engineer. And, and he looked at it and said, oh, this is all great, but I, no, I have no use for your axiomatic stuff. Oh, wait a minute. Um, before he, he started, he, he worked on startup, funding his own startup, worked on uh, network protocols. And, you know, you know about the head blade, but, you know, before that, had a bunch of other stuff. And one of the realizations he came to was that, um, first, most of the network protocols are written in C. And they have bugs that can be there for 20, 30 years because they get found, right? And it doesn't depend only on how good you are. Every programmer, no matter how smart he is, has some error rate. At some point, you get some bug there. It is just mechanic or whatever it is, you know, you just keep at it at some point, you get some bug sleep, okay? Everybody has error rate. And this a very costly, even when you get experts together to look at the same uh, piece of code, they, they can't always catch some of the egregious bugs, right? And, and so he wanted to include um, deduction and, and checking into, into the, uh, uh, these systems. And uh, so th that led to you know, what we call dependent types. And originally, when I started Liz, I was using exactly the, uh, the, the grammar that's in Stefanov's book. And after Jason, you know, came in, in the summer 2012, I had to rewrite the, the password because um, using SQL syntax for template, you no know, dependent type is very awkward. Just for the same reasons that we introduced the new declaration syntax in C++, which say auto function parameters in the say return type, so that you can use some parameters in a return type, basically for the same reason. And Jordan is the was the latest uh, in the team, and he's uh, he's uh, very helpful with the uh, library and, and also the. Uh, <coughs> The, the compiler. Now, the the project didn't actually came to fruition till uh, Alex released uh, this book. You know, I remember back in 2007 at Hopal 3, I was given by uh, Paul uh, a, a draft of the the, the book, and it changed between 2007 and and. In 2009, it was when 
book was published. And I went to say, okay, wait a minute. I think if you want to have concept for C++, and at the time, concept were already, no, C++ OX concept were already going down. I think it must resemble this. And then for me, the question was, can I type check this? So that was when we started, and uh, and 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 Carla started writing the parser, studying the rules, and had a lot of conversations with Paul. Shen was also involved, and and so forth. But this was actually the for me the catalyzer for you now pushing this uh, project forward. So, what do I call conventional type checking? Well, this one actually is very popular, right? C++ made object oriented mainstream, it took it from the labs into the street, to everybody. The way it works is essentially you have some pointer to data of unknown size, you don't know the size of you know, the data that the pointer is pointing to, and you have some table of operations. Okay, and then you separate concern, you no know, interface, you no know, definition, the news, and, and the roles are set up so that everything just works fine. We know how this works. Okay, and if we want to make advancement with our template system, we shouldn't end up with this. Because we already have this. We have tried several times to make it work. It just doesn't deliver what STL allows us to do. Okay, so this is one example of type, conventional type checking that I think we shouldn't end up with. If we end up with this, then we have fails. Again. Um, the other one really comes from uh, functional programming community. Um, ever since I've been working on uh, concept, I'm always called on in conferences. Oh, why don't you just take Haskell type classes? And then to patiently explain that, well, Haskell has a very beautiful type system that doesn't work for C++. And then you say, why not? And then you go and explain, well, Haskell that requires you to say, and nah, nah, nah. But the fundamental thing is that the type system Haskell is beautiful, it's great. But it is not the solution to the problems we have. The problem we have in C++ is that we want the ability to write specification independently of use. The, the core of the Haskell type system is what we call a Hindley Miller system. The principle is this. You write your function definition. Don't put type anywhere. The compiler will deduce the type for you. The fact that the compiler deduces the type for you is also a proof that somehow your program is correct. It doesn't say it is right, right? It just says it's correct. It, you know, the operations will do the operations. You won't pretend that a string is an integer, right? You won't do any of those things. It will be type correct, but not necessarily right. Furthermore, it starts from the principle that the implementation is the specification, right? Write a function definition will deduce the type for you. A type for a function is always a summary. It is a specification. It's a crude approximation of what the function is supposed to do. So give me an implementation, I'll tell you what the specification is. How do I know my specification is actually right for the problem I want to solve? The Hindley system, the Hindley Miller system doesn't solve that. Okay? It, it is really good. Okay? And, and as a matter of fact, if you look at C++ template system, we actually have part of it that looks like that. But the entire system can't be that. You must be able to separate definitions from specifications and from use. Okay, so that we can check what's going on. Now, what's Haskell, so, sorry, um, yeah, it's probably one big point. Just to illustrate, the previous slide was a bit abstract, but to illustrate this idea of uh, Hilly Mineral type checking, so imagine that the blue line would be deduced by the compiler. What you write is, you know, in in life in program, right? So here we have a function filter. What it does is you give it the predicate and the list, and it will return a list of all the items that satisfy the predicate. So 
So obviously, if you're trying to filter an empty list, it's an empty list. That's what the first line says. So in Haskell, you just write equations to state what you want. And the second line say, well, if I don't have an empty list, then I have at least a list of one element that is prepended to an existing list. So I have a list of x and some x's, right? And the colon there is just a way to decompose a, a list into head and tail, right? So imagine you have an iterator. When you reference the iterator, you forget the, the, uh, the head. But you have to increment to get the tail. And the colon is somehow an, you know, an abstraction of that idea. So when I'm filtering the list, if the list is not empty, I have this one element. So what I'll do is that I'll test the, uh, the predicates on the head. If the predicate holds true, then well, I'll keep that element. And then recursively, I'll filter the rest of the list. Otherwise, I'll just go onto, onto the tail. Very simple, you write what you want in two or three lines, and it reads like English. Fantastic. And then you run a compiler, it comes back and say, hey, you, the specification is you take a predicate, something from, you know, a predicate that takes a, some element of type A, returns a bool, and a list, so bracket A means list of A's, and returns list of A's, right? So this is Hindley Miller system. And because it can do this for you, it is really fantastic. And interestingly, to make this happen, you need only five rules. The type checking rules, we have five, okay? And it is a deductive system. It's a logical system. You write a compiler with that logical system, and you submit any, any statement, so any function definition. It will come back with either error, doesn't make sense, oh yeah, it makes sense, and here is what it's supposed to, to do. Okay, but this is not sufficient for C++. Okay, so when people say Haskell type classes, what they mean is essentially, oh, take Hindley Miller system, and, and then from time to time, you want to overload some operations. Probably on the previous slide, one the point I want to make is that for this system to work, uh, there is an implicit assumption that every single symbol in your program has a unique interpretation. So here, brackets is, means always list. And colon, that way, always means append or prepend, right? Because every symbol has a unique interpretation, that is how the compiler with this deductive system is able to work out, right? Because it doesn't know, oh, ABS, is it ABS of int, double, you know? There is no ambiguity. Okay. And this is one reason why it doesn't work. And it doesn't support overloading. So when Haskell folks wanted overloading, they said, well, okay, we'll still maintain the claim that you only need to provide a definition and we'll provide we'll deduce the specification for you, the type for you. But for that, you also need to declare something what they call class. So what they call class is only the same as in C++. So what they call class is just a collection of types that happen to share some common operations that are overloaded, right? So here you say that, well, you have a class EQ, EQ of A, all the type A that happen to be equality comparable, they must somehow provide uh, an operation that compare them to elements uh, for equality and non-equality. Now, once you have this, and you write these two lines. So forget about the first line. Get just these two lines. The compiler will be able to deduce for you the type of a function. The way it does it is just like previously, except that now we are also using some symbols that put constraints on what the type A could possibly be. And then the compiler will go back and say, okay, well, this member function that tests whether an element is in the list works only if your type, the type of the items happen to supply an equality operator, okay? But when you look carefully, again, it is bottom up, why? It's not top down, it's always bottom up. 
you you yeah please uh. should you recurse <laughs> oh yes i should recurse here you're right um yeah it's false it should be a member of yeah so this was type check but not wrong <laughs> <laughs> And, and made my point. <laughs> Thank you. So, so this is the bug. It should not be false. It should be a member of X, Y. Um, but again, it is bottom up. Okay, that, that's all uh, it, it does. And for C++, we want the ability to specify what the fine function will be um, without having to supply the implementation. Okay, for various reasons, good reasons. Now, it is what has been, you know, if you want to have a career in academia, um, don't work on C++. <laughs> okay, that's an exaggeration, but close enough. Uh, Please use Hindley Miller and Eversoft and just tweak a little bit and you'll have ton, tons of papers and, 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 and wonderful career. Um, I don't believe that it scales to the to handle correctly the size of the problems that we face when building software or C. Okay. Uh, I'm pretty sure I'll make some enemies out there, but, um, and I would like to be proven wrong, but so far, I haven't seen any size of a program to the, you know, take Chrome, take Internet Explorer, take Office, the yeah, recently C++, and the, the infrastructure behind, the number of lines of code behind is not comparable to anything I've seen so far uh, for Haskell or for any other ML system. Doesn't mean that they're bad, just that if you want to scale, I believe you need something other than Hindley Miller. Now, what is, what is that thing different that I would like to see? Well, look at this picture. We have this some sphere. And a curve, you know, so algebraic curves, degree, 42, 43, I can remember. And then this is a lot of properties. And one question is, well, the first thing is, if you want to represent this, these two objects uh, in your program, uh, you will need some form of data structure. And mathematicians like to use you know, parameterization, right? If you're doing graphics, you like to parameterize so that you can should do proper lights and reflects and, and that kind of stuff. Um, and sometimes uh, they would just like to have slightly different representation, what they call implicit uh, equations, right? So for a sphere, for example, this is a mathematical theorem. It says that you cannot represent a sphere with less than two parameterization. If you take only one parameterization, there will be at least one point you cannot reach. So you need at least two cards, charts to, to represent a sphere, parametrically. That's a mathematical theorem. And, and because they're going to overlap, you also need some you know, uh, coherence you know, relations that you have to check and of that. Okay? But if you go with implicit equations, all you have to say is that, oh, a sphere is all the points at a fixed, now given distance from a fixed point, right? x squared plus y squared plus z squared equal r squared. That's all you need to say. Just one equation for a sphere. But if you want parametrically, you need at least two charts. Otherwise, you'll meet, miss one point. That's geometry. Not my claim. It's uh, geometry claim. Um, now, the question I want to ask you is if you want your programs to be simple, wouldn't you also want to have fewer template parameters in your programs? Is that desirable? I would think so. If you don't believe me, I will show you fragments of real-world code that's distributed, used by a lot of people, 
almost every C++ programmer. And I would like to know whether you really, really want to write that class. <laughs> okay. Um, any questions so far? No. Okay. So uh, this is just some grade, no, not too much um, um, math. So working with implicit functions is really nice because it gives you a very global view of what's going on. So if you're developing a large scale system software, you want to have a, a concise way of talking about you know, the global behavior. And then sometimes you want to div, you know, very deep into components. So if you want this analogy, you want you know, implicit functions that allow you to have a global view of what your system is doing. And then you want to have parameterized template, whatever they are, so that you can control locally what's going on. Okay. Now, this is what worries me. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Two years ago, that class had actually 13 template parameters. As of this morning, it has only 10. <laughs> okay, so this is a class template. Imagine you have a function in your API. It has 10 parameters. We have many of those, they come from C, right? Um, so all of them are type names, right? So imagine you have this function, takes 10 parameters, they are all int. Tell me, when do you know that you're supplying the parameters or the arguments in the right order? You don't. You don't. <laughs> that worries me. So this is uh, used as implementation of hash table in popular standard library implementations. Okay. And so I did. I was, no, so this of course is invalid. So that's. I had to take away the template argument there so that it can fit on, on, on the slides, okay? But you can Google this and, and or Bing this. Um, <laughs> and, and find where it comes from. This worries me. This is what you get when you insist that you need to control the parameters that you need to write your software. Sometimes you don't have a choice, but I do believe this is going too far, okay? And I know some of my friends will be unhappy with me, but that's my belief. Okay, so what I would like to see is a top-down. So I, we saw earlier that you know, the Hindu immune system is bottom-up view, right? You, you build things up and you discover something. What I would like is a system that also allows to have um, a top-down view where you state global properties of what you want, and then you figure out later on what really implements the, the, the property, okay? Um, and to some degree, uh, this, is, this is in Sipanov's book. Of course, he didn't start with axioms. He started with real algorithms and, and work his way out. Okay, oh, here, here are the, the real requirements that make, you know, that parameterize the algorithms. And if I, if I weaken these assumptions, then I can get these. If I strengthen, I can get the other stuff. So that's why we get, you know, input iterator, forward iterator, random access iterators. But, you know, the whole thing started with real algorithms. And then you work your, your way out by looking at smaller components. Um, so in C++, we were like, we, we know how to state this, right? Have sort function and then you have comparator and most of the time it works, except when it doesn't. When it doesn't, people get obscure error message and it would be nice, oh, very good, if we could actually state the relationship between the comparator and the, the iterator that we're using to, to, to you know, to, delimit the sequence we want, we want to solve. As written, it, they are just completely two independent entities, right? They don't have any relationship. That's not true, right? Um, the, the comparator must be able to take something from the value type, things you dereference from the iterator. So there is some relationship. And, and how to state this has been, you know, in previous decade, a lot of people poor uh, energy efforts and, and brain power into it, and uh, we didn't succeed. We're trying again. 
Um, so what I would like, again, to have is a, you know, this top-down view, what we call co, you know, final core algebra, it's you know, technical term, you know, previous view is initial algebra. And uh, if you look at the Stefanos book, it's actually remarkable because it has only about five primitives that allow you to do this. Another observation is, if you look at the STL, it doesn't actually construct anything, right? Most of the time, it asks for something. Oh, am I at the end? Uh, if not, then please move me uh, again. Uh, give me the value. But it doesn't actually construct object. When it needs to construct object, it asks, where should, where should I place this object? That's the allocator, right? And, and then, please give me the constructor. But it doesn't actually it's a construct things internally. Most of the time. Working? Okay. Yeah. Uh, most of the time, um, it just asks questions and work with the answers. So it is very different from the object-oriented view, right? Object-oriented view. They want really want you to see what is the type of this object. That is not a really meaningful question. From development perspective, I think the better answer, the question we should be asking is how can I use this object? That's all that matters. And the object, the STL works that way. So, if you look at the STL and, and the, uh, the elements, it has about five basic notions. A bit like Euclid's, right? With his five action. The first thing is, oh, can I call this thing? So, notion of function. This is simplification. Uh, Stefano has actually a notion of procedure, and I'm just simplifying here, going directly to functions. And the next thing is, if you want to call it, so how many arguments should I supply? So that is the arity. It doesn't actually say that how many arguments the function takes. It just say how many should I supply? So the function could, you know, the, the callable thing can have default argument and that kind of stuff. And, uh, and from time to time, you want to bridge the gap. So what what, what, what should be the type of thing that should bring into that position? That's the input type. And then uh, sometimes you want to say, oh, what should I take out? For example, if you want to have uh, iterate something, you want to put in something that has the same time as what well gets out. Okay, and you want to state relations. You want to state that those two types are the same. So that's the equality. Okay, those, these five primitives were the only ones that I needed to construct the least system, the core type checking uh, part of, of the system. So th th I find that remarkable. Um, and so to give you an example, so here, imagine I have a, a function type takes a, a vector, so you point a vector, so you, you plant, you know, arrows at places that you get this vector field. So it does satisfy the notion of you know, function, it's a RISD2, and input type at, uh, you know, first position is point, second position is vector, and the code domain, what you get out is this vector field. If you plant these arrows in your field, you get a vector field, okay? Um, now, then he goes on to define a notion of homogeneous function. So if you look at the book, you know, I really want you to get a copy of this book. You know, I have no stock in, in the book, okay? So, but I do believe it is a book that everybody should have. At least everybody in this room should have. And everybody interested in C++, writing programs should read that book. Um, so it says that homogeneous function is a function that takes at least one, um, one argument. And all the arguments are of the same type. I could go and express the same thing by using local coordinates, like template parameters, or I could just state that. So the first line says, well, I should take at least one argument. And the second line is just a logical statement saying that all input type are the same. So see here, I'm just using equal equal between two types. That is fine, okay? The fact that we can't, um, use equal equal types in C++ 
is this not something fundamental? It is just a syntax issue. Okay. Um, hopefully, one day we'll solve it. I'm sorry? If I said we have, yeah, we, instead of equal, equal, we have is same. Yeah. And then, if, yeah. Uh, so, a, an example of homogeneous functioning is when you take the distance, function distance, that can be distance between two points, right? You get two points, homogeneous, uh, and then you get, you know, um, double. So, the return type doesn't need to be same as input type. A non-homogeneous function is one that will allow you to translate a point by some vector, right? So, you need a point and vector, you get to another point. Okay, so... If you look at this condition, it says that all input time are the same. So that make it possible to define that common type. So in Lease, you can actually define a function. So think that this is some kind of type function, right? That's what it is. You know, the in Lease, the Evaluated the same way you evaluate context for functions. And I really wish we had a simple syntax in C++. Then, uh, but well, we have template aliases, but uh, I wish we had more direct notation. And all of these things are actually evaluated at compile time when you compile in these program, and they are needed too because you need to reduce all these things. Um, so the next thing that Savannah defined is the notion of operation. It says that, well, an operation is a homogeneous function for which the input type, the domain, is the same as code domain. I say that, right? It's, this is what it says. It says, well, the concept of operation is the one where you know, we take all homogeneous functions and the code domain is the same as domain. That's all. So far, none of these has said anything about how the operation is represented. Is it real executable code like you have in C? Or is it uh, object, you know, function objects? Or is it some other lambda stuff? It doesn't say anything like that. But if you want to express this directly in C++, you, with template parameters, you will have to go through hoops. To, to avoid saying anything at all about the actual representation. And sometimes I think you can't, right? We have this callable invoke in the standard library that says a lot of things without actually telling you what, is, what it is, okay. So, uh, and a binary operation, now we're getting more concrete, right? We're fixing the number of uh, uh, arguments and say, well, the RT must be two. Again, with any only these statements, we are able to type check Lee's program. Okay, so Lee's program. Imagine the programs in Stefano's book. Okay, I'm just using slightly different syntax. The the real problem doesn't change at all. As I said, I started with the syntax in the book. Only changed this notation when we started you not know, taking dependent types seriously. Um, and uh, oh, so here define operation. So imagine this is just a funny syntax for templates, right? So have function template square that takes an x of type const reference to uh, the, to the domain um, and the operation that we want to square, and just apply f to x x. This is almost exactly the program in Stefano's book. The only the syntax change, but the everything else stays the same. We can type check this. Okay? With only these axioms. This is what I call axiomatic programming. You don't say anything about a concrete representation. You only say what you you intend to have. So it's kind of declarative form, but it is really axiomatic. And if you look at the axioms Carefully, they are actually constructive. Okay, again, this goes back to Euclid. Right? When we talk about Euclidean geometry and all that, all the, his axioms, they are all constructive. It's quite interesting. So, how, <coughs> sorry, 
does this get type checked? So here you see that we are actually using uh, a concept as a type. And we are going to have this in concept life, where you can use a unary concept as a type. So the idea is that when you have that, you have implicitly some type, right? So alpha here, uh, this big dot just means type name, think type name. So yeah, sensitize some invalid type. Um, it has to obey the predicates that it is a binary operator. So you fix that time. And then you use it now in uh, the actual function type. So you see here the actual function type is a cost reference to the domain of that type T. And that type T, which is the, um, uh, the, the type of the operation. And then you get back the domain of the operation type. Okay. So this gets type checked and internally stored in the data structure that represents this. Uh, I'm just putting the mathematical notation for it, but the actual data structure, yes? In that example, f is a keyword, f x of x is a keyword, and the f itself. So this, this declares a parameter. Ref is a keyword that says reference. I skipped over that. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. And uh, so it, it's just applying this operation to a value from its domain. Thanks. So I can use this for, you know, say earlier, oh, do I have code? No, like in C. So that would be the multiplication function, the first function. Or do I have a function object? So I didn't define it, didn't have the slide to define. But imagine this is plus angle bracket, not square bracket. So in this notation, this the equivalent of template bracket. So plus angle bracket, int, and you instantiate the curl is in um, in Liz are just constructors, right? You probably know that we introduce um, uniform initialization syntax in C++ using braces. We just think that braces are operators. In Liz they are, C++ they are not. But if you had a syntax, that would be what it is. So we just create some function objects. So the square function works for objects and pointer to codes without any assumption of the representation. All that is needed are the properties. How can I use this as opposed to what it is? Okay. Um, yeah. Um, so concepts are not just uh, syntactic requirements. Uh, you know, previous we already had syntax. They also, they also have semantics, right? Uh, and if you look at Stefanov's book, he spent a great amount of time on the semantics. And that's what he uses to actually refine his, uh, his algorithm. So in, in Liz, you can state semantics properties as axioms. So for example, if you want to have associativity, we all know that, you know, uh, at least concat string concatenation is associative. It is not commutative, but it's associative, right? You have uh, f of f of a, b, and then f of a, f of a, b. C. Uh, it should be b, c. So this one is type checked and not verified. <laughs> okay. So another bug, this should be B and, and, and that one should be C. Thanks. So all dangers of type checking not verified. <laughs> uh, so this utility just means, well, um, if, you know, usually F will be some binary operator, right? Uh, thanks. Uh, you know, GCD is not operator, but it's one of those things we, we actually use. And they're actually useful. The associativity is useful if you're trying to decompose, you know, you're going to reduce your screen concatenation or GCD of a sequence of elements, you probably want to split into pieces and then concatenate them individually and you know, concatenate the result. And you want to guarantee that we wouldn't change the result of the, 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 the operation if you just did naively. So that's what associativity is all about. 
And then uh, in this, you can assert. So this one is not checked, right? You, this is this is the kind of reinterpret cast, right? You say, oh, trust me, um, I know this one is associated. Uh, so this is probably one of the places where I was, I'm not bold enough. You know, I could say, oh, uh, the compiler has to prove everything. Uh, then I wouldn't be able to do anything at all, right? Because it requires just so much that you can prove automatically. Uh, but it is one of those places where you tell the compiler, uh, I know these facts to be true. Please use them. Now, you run the risk of having some inconsistent system in the end. Um, because there are syntax specific for those, you can actually, if you really, really want to, to have proof for them, you can extract them to some theorem prover outside the list. Because I really don't want to require programmers to start doing proofs in, in the program. Uh, and, and, and do that, you know, get that uh, proof if, if you want it. So the, the semantics properties in Liz are used for, you know, during overall resolution when there is, you know, a tie or you know, there's a constraint that something has to be there. So concretely, an assumption like this is stored in a database, just like we store template specializations in database and query when needed. Uh, okay, so here's a complete uh, another example that use the notion of associated uh, values. Uh, so uh, if you if you look at uh, what we call mono aid operations, uh, for example, now they will be associative, but then it will also be a distinguished element that wouldn't actually do anything to to, to element when when you combine them. So plus would be zero, multiplication would be one. Uh, if you take GCD, it would be Zero. Uh, so you have many operations like that in, in real world computing that have these kind of monoids neutral elements. So here, just stating that um, the, the notion of neutral values, it's an axiom. So anything that defines axiom is taken as an axiom. Is, the, the notion is that for every element in the domain of the operation, this element E is such that when so something, yeah, so when you compose uh, X with E, with uh, that uh, operation, you get X back. And if you compose the other way, you also get X back. So uh, this is another place where I don't use equality, I use equivalence. Um, because, um, again, I was, I'm starting from the C, C++ core semantics. You want to interchange values. You don't necessarily have equality defined by a user for you, but you want the ability to interchange value. And this is what I call uh, behavioral equivalence. So a concrete example of this is, imagine you have a function that returns some value, let's say a string. And you return a string. So in the body, you say return s, right? It's some string that you compute and you want to return it. That string that you're returning, you want to get the same value from the outside, from the caller, right? But for a bad example, string has equal, equal. But the, the, what you get, you know, what's being returned is the same as in the outside. And being able to return a value doesn't require you to have equal, equal. Okay, so that's what I call behavioral equivalence. It is rooted in, in C++. Okay, and that's what this equivalence is for. It's really behavioral equivalence. Whatever I get there is what I want there. And they may or may not be equal, right? So if you take, a better example would be a, a none, not a number. Uh, n not numbers, they don't compare equal, not even to themselves, right? So if you return a none from your function, you really want to get that same nan on the outside, you don't want it bit to just flip, you know, on wing. So that is behavioral equivalence. Um, question? Yes. So you're using equivalence over here, um, and this is something that couldn't be checked at compile time. Um, and 
the notation that you're using here is necessarily only going to be a subset of the kind of axioms that you might have. Some of them might have to be written as a count. Like this is a Turing complete mm -hmm. function. Mm -hmm. So I, I wonder what the use is to have this subset of um, axioms that you can write in this notation that aren't checked. Ah, okay, good, good question. So, uh, how much the actually? Oh, uh, so the, the question is, um, when you look at this axiom, um, it it is written in a certain logical language, uh, using here equivalence that it just defines behavior equivalence, not logical uh, equivalence, and so that is a restriction of what could be possibly written. And the question is how a user uh, would be able to write something that's bigger than what the, uh, that logical language allows. Uh, that's a very good question, one that I, I never found a good answer for. I had long debate with Biani when we were back in, in Texas. So here I use logical, uh, sorry, behavior equivalence. But it is not a requirement. You could use equality if that is what you want, right? And you know, it will be checked at runtime because it is no longer an operation that is internalized by the compiler, but something that happens at, at runtime. Um, at this point, I do not know, and I suspect more. You know, experiments will tell me where I should put the bar. The one thing we have to keep in mind is that first of all, all of the concepts are written in first order logic, and first order logic is undecidable. And one of the things I was trying is to bring in automatic deduction. So I must have um, um, decision procedure for the logical language. I'm not too precise on the, on the slide, but when you get to write the type rules, you have to be more precise, right? So the, the, for the logical, for example, do I use all the integers? The answer is no. I use only uh, Presperger arithmetic, and that is sufficient for dealing with RIT and everything else, right? So Presperger arithmetic is you start with zero, you can uh, add one all the time, you can compare things, you cannot multiply by arbitrary number. You can multiply by a constant number because if you multiply by two, for example, it's just adding the same thing twice. If you multiply by five, you're just adding five times. But there is no arbitrary multiplication. And that theory is decidable. It is sufficient to handle almost everything that is in Stefano's book. The one thing that I don't know how to handle because it's not decidable is the, the ring theory. Uh, that is part of, in part of the book, but you know he hasn't spent too much time on it. That's great. And for iterators, Presperger arithmetic is all you need. So the short answer is we need more experiments and more feedback. And that's a great question. Thanks. Yes. Do you support operations that have multiple domains? Like for example, plus has int as a domain or double as a domain. So that will be overloading, yes. Uh, so you can overload symbols in lists. So can I, for? Oh, sorry. Uh, the question was, uh, sorry. The question was, do I support uh, operations with different domains? And by different domains here, mean uh, if you take plus, for example. Uh, you have plus on integers, plus on doubles, plus on strings, and you know, is that supported? And the answer is yes. You had follow-up question? Uh, I was just curious how that worked. Oh, so question, how does it work? So um, when you uh, you call the function neutral value, or sorry, the, not the function, the, the, the axiom neutral value, here, in this situation, we have overloaded operation. It will be ambiguous. But if you uh, use the at symbol from, from the previous slide, you can use the at symbol to restrict uh, the type of an ambiguous symbol. So for example, this is construction. It is ambiguous. But I'm saying construction at the type plus of int. So that restricts 
the, the, the expression and make it very unambiguous. So the same thing is, oops, why? The same thing happens here. When you use the at of neutral value over something, if that something is ambiguous, you just use the at notation, like so at int, comma int gives int, and you can think of it as the equivalent of static cast in C++ to resolve an ambiguous uh, function symbol. Okay. Yes. So uh, you can uh, declare these named axioms. You can define them. You can assert them, and you do uh, uh, function dispatch based on them. But you never actually, as far as I can tell, use the definition of the axiom to check the properties. So what's the point of actually defining? Them? Very good question. So the question is: um, so if you've been paying attention. Uh, you, <laughs> you notice that uh, you know you can define axioms. You you can use them to assert properties that go into into databases. But the, the bodies of the axioms are not actually run. In I don't show an example where they're running anyway. And so so you know could I just dispense with the body and just have some you know dummy name? Um, the, the answer to that is, in fact, in the full development, when you use assert these axioms, you can extract them on the side, right? And try to check whether they are correct. But it is, the checking is not done by the compiler itself because although I wanted to have automated deduction, the compiler, I, don't, I didn't want to turn it into a full brown theorem prover, okay? So the body of the action themselves are not run directly in the code, but you can use them on the, on the side to, to check for the consistency and give extra confidence to your program. So it is not completely useless. If you do not extract them, yeah, they don't exist, just like some random tag. But the idea is you express the actual semantics in your program, and with the aid of additional tools, you bring uh, greater confidence to, to, the, uh, to the system. So what's the difference between these axioms and the comments? What is the difference between these axioms and the comments? The, the difference is quite obvious. The comments are white spaces. <laughs> 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 these axioms, they are not white spaces. You can extract them. You can extract comments. If you have a tool, you can extract comments. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you have to have an external tool to extract these axioms, and then only then you can do something. Yeah, so in a comment, what, what you could put in a comment, you, so these, the body of these axioms use uh, the, the language itself, right? So with this additional... Um, okay. So it's the syntax of these axioms. The, the, the syntax is checks plus you have elaboration, right? So it's not just syntax, you know, type checking rules, and you can actually, um, so what I call it by elaboration is when, you, when you, you can generate code, right? It is just not executable. You can generate code for this every time you assert it. So you can say, if you wanted to inject, for example, debugging, uh, sorry, you're doing debugging, you can say, well, put a watch point here. Every time they run these action, right? The pre and post condition people like to do programming by contract uh, and, and, and you know check. Essentially, you can generate tests, run their tests. Yes. Yeah, yeah, but they are not inserted in the by default in the. In the yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and actually in the last slide I had a point on, on that, but that's very uh, valid and, and interesting point. Thanks. So one question is, you know, I've done all these kind of obfuscation and, and what, what do we get out of it? Um, the first thing is that we have a higher level specification of what 
we want, right? It just gives a glimpse into what is possible. Within the C++ you know, framework, I use different syntax of that, but the core is there, the core semantics is there. Um, so the actions give you this explicit statement of properties. Um, if you wanted to have more confidence in the, the software, you can actually you know, generate you know, use external tools, to improvers, or you know, and and get uh, more confidence. Uh, the other thing is, I didn't confess to this when I started, which is that I hate traits. They should have never existed. They existed only because we didn't know how to expect things earlier. And no, we should aim to eliminate those uh, th those traits. Uh, so th these ideas, I've tried them in two different uh, framework. So before writing the Liz system, I already had this uh, computer algebra system called Axiom, right? Um, and uh, so one of the, the students was, okay, can we use these semantic, additional semantics properties to do automatic parallelization, you know, or just controlling threads and, 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 and so forth. And it's actually quite enlightening. Uh, it was very positive, and it was presented at uh, ISAC in 2011. Um, and so Eric Katzen was a student who really wanted to learn more about generic programming and teaching him generic programming through these, you know, Eric style, you know, statements of properties and so forth, and, and reasoning about the algorithm based only on what is assumed it was very much more positive than. Um, other attempt I've done earlier by just, oh, look at these requirements from the standard library and, and this is what get. Because now, if I make a mistake like I've made, then you, know, you can call me on it, right? This, you, 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 can, you can argue your way around colors, right? I don't like blue, I prefer red. Uh, when you put the axioms, you don't mess with the facts. You right or you wrong, but not, yeah, I don't like your arguments. Um, so, uh, for me, the most important thing, especially since I started this for C++ concept, was to give feedback to, to the community about what we can try today and, and we know it can work. And, and so, for example, using concept as uh, just the type of something, you know, short, what we call shorthand notation, and using predicates uh, and do simple deduction that has made its way into Andrew Sutton's uh, implementation. Uh, and, you know, his implementation out there you can try, uh, but originally most of the work uh, were done uh, in Liz. Um, of course, at the time as academics, you know, you need to have, you know, formal semantics. And even today, even I'm not academic in um, you know, development organization, uh, we do static analysis. And you do need precise rules that you can check. Um, and if you find bugs, you have to explain why you think it is a bug. And you have to explain to the dev why something is wrong. So you do need you know, these uh, formal statements. Um, so I'm going to skip on this, how it works. and. I don't know how much time is left. Minutes. Ten minutes. So, okay. I'm just going to, to skip a little bit over uh, the, uh, the, the, the the Greek stuff and just show you uh, this example. So, when I have this statement like this, how how does the compiler turn it into something that is executable inside a compiler? So, it is actually very simple. So, the first thing I think I explained earlier, you, you see the function concept used as a type. What we do first is to synthesize a, a type variable and say that it has to satisfy these predicates, the substitute in there, and this you know, logical formula. Now, if you look at this logical formula, it is in the, what I called earlier the theory of Presbyterian arithmetic, so it is decidable. Okay, um, there are a lot of algorithms there. There is a theorem that says that the best algorithm will have double exponential complexity. Don't get scared, okay? In practice, we don't see that. 
So it actually happens. Uh, so this thing is actually very efficient. So mo most of the arithmetic theory, they, 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 you know, you can squeeze them into this, um, in this arithmetic. And the other thing is, that I want to say is that this presbyteria arithmetic, it is already in your compiler today. The optimizers, they use it. Right? When you're doing aut automatic vectorization and you have nested loops and they want to flip things around, there is a, you know, a common method based on, on simplex or linear programming, but they all go back to you know, Presbyteria arithmetic, which is desirable. And they use that today. So this is not like, oh, bringing some huge theorem prover into your compiler. All we're saying here is that it's already there, just make it work with the, the technology make it slightly more generic so they can work with the, uh, uh, the type system. I saw a, you had a question? Yes. I, I don't really see a difference between the top and the bottom. <laughs> so uh, the question is, there is no difference between the top and the bottom. And, and, and that observation is correct. This one is the programmer level statement. And this one is the, it's a statement of the internal data structure that the compiler uses. You know, I just didn't have enough. Uh, I didn't know whether drawing all the diagrams or just writing the formula that the compiler internally uses is. So when we're doing type checking, so you, you turn this into, so this is a universal quantification. So you turn it into an existence quantification by just taking a negation. And then you only work on the non-quantified formula and you come back with some answer yes no and then you do the negation that that's uh -oh. and this is you know presbyteria arithmetic is already in your compiler today okay and you know if the optimizer is using it it must be good for the tab checker too um so i'm going to uh, go over this and probably the last slide what i would really like to see uh, going forward is first I'd like to get to see the standard notation in the community to express semantics properties of our library software. Uh, and I would like to see more of concepts. Uh, I'm tired, I, I've, you know, I, probably you don't, I'm tired of iterators. Okay, that that has been beaten. You know, Alex did everything. Uh, yeah, you, you can do it, but that's all. Okay, we, we need something different. There are a lot of fields out there that we need to explore so we get better understanding. Okay, um, I would like to have a, you know to see the community build a repository, a common shared knowledge, just like Boost has built this shared. Libraries that you know people go and is the go to my company invest in in Boost, right? Uh, so it must be good. Uh, and, and I would like to see the community build shared repository knowledge that we can all use and and have a way to aid semantics our tools now static analysis uh, tools or even runtime as I indicated earlier. So this will be my uh, last slide. Um, any more questions? We have a mic up here. Oh, where is the mic? There. We have oh. a mic up here. Yeah. People have okay. questions. This is a good question. Yes. <laughs> the question is why did I call it Liz? Uh, <laughs> My, my, so Liz is not, this is not the name of a girlfriend, okay. <laughs> uh, so the name actually came from uh, my first student who worked on, on Project Kala. Um, I asked her, okay, we have been working on this for six months now. I think we need a uh, better name than uh, The Thing. <laughs> and, and she came back with Liz and wanted to make sure that uh, I wouldn't be embarrassed if asked why Liz. <laughs> um, and then she told me the story um, about 
someone, you know, a little girl she met in the Amazonian forest. Uh, she spent uh, two weeks there with the family and, and she was just, you know, fond of the, uh, the girl and the girl was five or something and just she wanted to choose them. I, I thought that was a good story. I didn't have any better suggestion. All the three characters were taken. So <laughs> uh, uh, unless I had better suggestion, I'll just take it and uh, yeah. That's uh, name. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, another question. Um, is it purely academic or is there is there actually a use case why you developed this? So the question is whether this exercise is purely academic or whether there is a use case. Uh, I started with the idea that I wanted to improve the C++ template system. Right? That, that, that's my end goal. Uh, so I could do all the work with GCC or Clang or, or C++. But I don't have to to pay too much attention to distraction. What I call distraction is all the anarchic conversion rules uh, in C++. You no, we shouldn't have them. Um, the, the syntax. I started with syntax, right? You know, type name, t, colon, colon, template, and then you put your brackets and you feel good. That is distraction. Um, and, and I wanted just to focus on that, right? So. Um, that's why I am at least, but the end goal has always been to improve the C++ template system. And, you know, I gave it back to Biani and Andrew. So Andrew, when he started, you know, we were all worked together on concept lights and, and the deduction algorithm were taken directly from Blaze and then he improved it to take, you know, once you want to go to the real world, you have to take into account all those distractions you just didn't want to hear about earlier. So uh, from my view, it is not purely academic. It has end goal with very practical, better this tool that is just awesome, C++. Yeah, uh, yeah. I have two more minutes. Yes, sir. Uh, you have here yeah, the um, concept and the model that social side of concept, but uh, it seems to me that uh, this is implicit by the syntax. <coughs> and only we are uh, stating that uh, we assume that the actions are satisfied. But uh, maybe something that has a sub-syntax that has nothing to do with the concept, or even can have uh, the same type that can be seen as the same concept, but the difference is the substantiation. How we do you take in account these cases? So the question is, if, if you look at the list is already presented, everything is almost implicit. You had the concept, you have the types, and what actually happens is that the type satisfies the predicate of the concept, and so that is a model. Uh, but there is no syntax in language that allows you to manipulate directly the model. Yet, it may be the case that um, you have the same type that to model uh, to concepts, to different concepts. Is, am I getting that right? Or the same concept. Uh, differently. So, but an example for that would be if you take the integers, then integers and plus give you um, a monoid and integers with neutral element zero. Integers and multiplication gives you monoid with one as neutral element. And, and the question was, would it be good to have syntax? Is that, am I like getting the question correctly? Syntax is not enough. Yeah, that, that is map. Map. The, the syntax is not enough, and then you have to map. So that's a very valid point. And as a design decision, based on the experience that I had from the C++ OX effort, 
it, it's a conscious decision not to have syntax for the models directly that the, the satisfaction should be implicit. This is also in line with what I call automated deduction. It is not the only conceivable design to have, but it is the one I have. Now, when you go back to uh, this slide, you'll see that actually I don't talk about monoid, I talk about monoid structures or monoid operations. So the type itself wouldn't be a monoid, it would be the operation. And from that perspective, there is no ambiguity. Yeah, exactly. So the, the design test was to focus on operation. That goes back to the design and the philosophy that if you look at the STL, iterators, you know, there's a lot of things have been saying and written about iterators, but they're not the most interesting thing about the STL, right? There are only four or five of them, or categories of them in the STL. What is important is the algorithm. Right? And so the design has focused on operation as opposed to on the time. And I want to push that as far as I could to see what breaks and what doesn't work. Because I do believe that having the type, sometimes you actually want to talk about a type, right? But most of the time you want to talk about the algorithm because these are operations that bring the structure. And uh, I wanted to support that as opposed to, because the other side, we know how it ends. It ends with object-oriented programming, right? 